Uh, we're about to begin the uh, second talk of this session. So presenting right now, we have Enzyme, uh, John Henner, and Hakim in absentia. And uh, the subject of this talk is going to be Pythons are deaf, so are some Pythonistas. So please give your attention uh, for this talk. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I get tired of hearing the sound of my own voice, so you won't have to hear it much either. I go by Enzyme because over my career, over 35 years in IT, I've really enjoyed accelerating projects and activities. I met John about a year ago, and we clicked, and here we are, and I think that's about all I have to say. He'll fill in the rest of the details. Take it away, John. Thank you, Anne. Hello, my name is Jonathan Hunter. I'm a doctoral candidate at Boston University. What I do mostly is I study how children acquire relational thinking. In my spare time, I enjoy playing with Python. I'm not very good, but I'm trying to get better. I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about what we're doing at Boston University. We have two different projects that I'm going to talk about. First is the ASL Clear project, and second is our attempt to create a summer camp for deaf children where we teach them how to use the Python language. Typically, when I present to a deaf audience, I take a few minutes to pause in between slides to give people an opportunity to read the slides before they have to look at the interpreter. I'm going to be following that as a matter of routine, so if I start pausing during the slides, that's just me expecting you to actually read before I talk. After Slides say, deaf and hard of hearing people are all low incident population, which is great for humanity, but not so great for the deaf community. So for most of you, I may be the first person, may be the first deaf person you've ever met, and I may also be the last deaf person you've ever met, and I'm really sorry about that. Because of different circumstances, most deaf children will experience some form of language deprivation. It doesn't matter what kind of assistive technologies are implanted or used. Because of like, the different variety of factors, there's, for example, a lack of access to like, um, a real accessible language, uh, especially a lack of access to incidental language learning. Um, most deaf children will unfortunately be unable to acquire language like a typical hearing person. Different interventions need to be used. We at Boston University believe that the most accessible language is sign language because it requires no expensive technologies, it doesn't require medical intervention, it doesn't require speech therapist, audiologist. What it requires is a person who knows ASL fluently and can model it appropriately. As the population, because of you know, disability politics as well as language deprivation, a very small percentage of deaf and hard of hearing children actually make it into STEM fields, much smaller than would be expected for the portion of the population that are deaf and hard of hearing. This is problematic because STEM fields, particularly STEM careers, are one of the best ways to a middle class income for a wide variety of people. In the United States, the statistics are something like 60% of deaf and hard of hearing people are unemployed. So clearly, this is a problem that we need to fix. The biggest problem, especially for deaf and hard of hearing people who rely on sign languages as their language modality of choice, is that STEM concepts are largely inaccessible. For example, a lot of teachers and interpreters for the deaf and hard of hearing don't have a good command of the vocabulary necessary to accurately translate a lot of the STEM jargon. If you have not had a science education, how would you translate programming terms from English to sign language? There's just not a lot of resources out there. Furthermore, a lot of STEM concepts require advanced cognitive abilities. They are usually not afforded to people that have language deprivation. A lot of the cognitive abilities that we depend on, for example, mathematic knowledge or metalinguistic knowledge that allows us to easily transfer what we know from one language to another, those things require a pretty solid linguistic foundation that 
because deaf kids will either acquire language later or there's a lot of gaps in their knowledge, those cognitive functions usually don't come to foray. So we recognized that there was a large issue, and although there are other options, we felt they were insufficient to meet the needs of deaf, hard of hearing interpreters and educators out in the world. This is where the ASL Clear project came to phrase. The ASL Clear project does summarize the ASL American Sign Language Concept Learning and Educational Resource. What we do is what we take an English word and we translate it into sign language. We don't just provide them a one-to-one -one mapping from the ASL sign to the English word. What we do is we follow appropriate learning procedures, appropriate educational methods, and we enmesh these vocabulary in lecture, definition, explanation, pretty much all the context that we expect to be necessary in order not to only learn the word or memorize it, but understand how to apply it in daily life. Therefore, we've created an entire library, not just of the words themselves, but the lecture that the words are embedded in, what these words mean, you know, and the signs themselves, of course. We've organized them by the category. I promise you we'll talk about Python eventually. One of the challenges of developing this application for a very unique community was understanding what does a deaf person need in web design. When people talk about web standards, they typically develop for a very small percentage of the spectrum or the a very small proportion of the population. However, people that have different language and different cultures usually view, or they usually have different needs and what is appropriate for good design. In the deaf and hard of hearing population, there is a theory, or an architectural theory called deaf space. You can usually see examples of deaf space at deaf-centered locations, for example, Gallaudet University and NTID, where they have built, you know, buildings and environments that are uniquely suited for the average deaf and hard of hearing person's need. Well-lit, open spaces, um, unobtrusive designs, like for example, you're usually not going to find a pillar in the middle of the room. Those are very awkward and take up space and they block everyone's view of what's going on. So we wanted to take the geometric architectural concept and apply them to web design. What does it mean to design something for a very visual population? There's not a lot of information out there, so a lot of what we had to do is we had to create, and we're still learning as we go. The project necessitated the development of three different applications. First is the vetting tool. And the vetting tool allows us to say, this sign is not only a good sign, because we couldn't just invent science. It's not like inventing vocabulary. You have to have a strong linguistic foundation. It has to follow the correct grammar. And it has to be conceptually accurate. So we had to recruit deaf people, specifically native signers, which are a very, very small population of a very, very small population, people who are truly fluent in the language and didn't just learn it later in life. And then we had to find not only native deaf signers, but native deaf signers who work in the scientific field, which is pretty much a unicorn here in the States. Well, not here in the States, there in the States. That is a little bit, yeah. The second thing is we had to develop a coding tool. The challenge of the coding tool was how do you get computers to recognize a sign, a visual language? It's easy enough or easier with spoken languages that have writing systems. You can feed a corpora into a computer. It can pretty much learn the language by analyzing the print form. They're making great advances in you know, analyzing spoken languages. You can see this, for example, in the Google Algo Caption programming. But sign language, because it had simultaneous grammars, which means that different parts of the syntactical and morphological structure are happening at the same time. I hesitate to use the interpreter as an example, but you can see how, for example, spatial morphology is being used at the same time. 
And space, as many of you know a lot better than I do, it's extremely difficult for a computer to understand. So the coding tool allowed us to assign labels to different parts of the signs so that the computer could better understand what they were. And of course, the actual search tool, which stakeholders are used to find these embedded STEM vocabulary. As mentioned before, we had to create some way of authorizing whether or not a STEM translation was a good one. Does it follow proper ASL grammar? Does it follow like the actual concept? If people look at the sign, can they, by taking apart the different parts of the sign, can they use the metal and get the judgment to understand what they're talking about? So here I'm going to show you a little video of the vetting tool in action. And you can see, as I will narrate, hopefully, like the different parts of the web design depth space that we included. You can see one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to share that there was no English in the tool. And the reason for that is because research showed that if you're a user of a minority language, you will default to the syntactical patterns of the dominant language. And we really wanted to pull that out and just have them use what they knew about sign language. So all the links, everything was in ASL. You can see that one of the things we had to do was we had to do we have each of the link play when it's clicked? Do we, how do we get these signs to the user in an easily understandable way so that we'll understand how things were oriented relative to each other and how to use them? So what we decided was the best way to do this was to use the mouse over technique. You can, I'm going to back up a little bit over here. And I want you guys to see this better. I'll show you a picture later. But how we ended up doing things that was that we provided the links you can see over here. And these are ways for the vetter to control the vetting application. For example, do they want to see the term? Do they want to see the definition? Do they want to see the lecture itself? And the videos play here. And everything, everything is done through sign language. And that little motor window allows better to say, this is a good sign, this is used in contact, we approve of this, everything is hunky-dory. We use, as many as you can see, a Likr system. There are some disadvantages to using a Likr, but for what it is, it's actually pretty good. It allows us to use the summative scale to determine whether or not the words were like good over a course of several different vetters. And moving on. This is the still shot of the vetting tool. You can see that the terms that have to be vetted are on the top. And then, as I mentioned before, the links are on the side. This is the basic navigation. And this was a really interesting development for us because, <coughs> excuse me, it really gave us an idea and to easily visualize what does the depth space in the web design mean. The coding tool, and I talked a little bit about this, is allowed us to map the different parts of the ASL sign to specific identifiers so the computer actually understands which sign is where in the database. This was extremely challenging for us for a lot of reasons. One is because of the simultaneous grammars of sign language. The second is we had a large discussion within our team was how do you identify the individual parts and in what we'll call the sign stream, which is the beginning of the sign to the end of the sign, and all the hand shapes, movements, and location between the beginning and the end. As ASL has no written system, we had to find a way that stakeholders could easily, you know, search for the sign using the different parts of the sign. One of the things we did is we defaulted to a graphing system that's already used in several schools for the deaf across the country. 
this Supala Subek system. And these are different parts of the hand shapes. So what, so what users do is they code, they wash the sign, they code the first two hand shapes, particularly the dominant hand and the base hand. Although we have the ability to code all the hand shapes in the sign stream, we decided that to make it easier for stakeholders that we would only use two hand shapes, one location, and two movements an external movement and an internal movement. Ultimately, the goal is to build a search tool which allows stakeholders to use ASL and ASL principles to search for STEM vocabulary in ASL. One of the most important things for us is that we wanted to make sure that users would have instantaneous feedback as they picked the graphemes necessary. We felt that having quick feedback from the back end will allow students to learn as they were selecting different parts of the sign. For example, if they selected the wrong hand shape and a different type of video would pop up, we want them to say, oh, no, 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 I didn't want that video. So they can deselect the different graphemes and put in a new grapheme. This was a technological, for, for us, this was really new. We had to use WebSocket to get this done. It's not something we had seen anything elsewhere for a video search engine. So for, for us, it was a lot of pushing boundaries, learning about how to use the different tools in a way that was suitable for this niche population. I did tell you that there would be actually some Python in here. This is the diagram that we use. This is this command that explains how our different projects work together. The apps are largely written in Python 3. When we started this project about three years ago, I was tasked to select a language for which that we would write. And I was looking at two languages. I was looking at Ruby, and I was looking at Python. And I'm an R programmer. I'm a researcher. So this was all very new for me. So the first thing I did was I looked at the description to the different languages. I looked at Ruby, and Ruby was like, Yes, we're chaotic, we're hard to read, but we get stuff done. And then I looked at Python, and it was simple, elegant, and easy to read. And I, we usually rotate our teams. We have a new team every year because we rely a lot on student programmers who unfortunately graduate and go out in the world. So every year we have to train a new team, and I realized that I needed the code to be portable from new team to new team to new team. So readability and ease of learn was really important to us. So because of that, we decided to go to Python. Our lead programmer would pick Python 3. There's reasons I cannot explain, but I can tell you why I like Python 3. As a non-programmer, I found it very difficult to install dependencies in Python 2.7. The other day, I learned for Python 3, there was a little function I could use called pip, where I could just type out Python 3 hyphen M pip install, and it took care of everything for me. I have to tell you, that was fabulous. For the back end, a programmer does not like using SKO. So he really enjoyed, particularly Flask, which was easy to get started, had a great community. Of course, you know, it was a well-tested framework, easily maintained, and it came with SKL Kami, which is very important for us as the database is one of the most important part of our projects. We, we have to store all the video, we have to store all the coding, all the science. Our programmers found the Flask Manager to be accessible and easy. And I'm really emphasizing the easy part here because, as I mentioned, every year we train a new programming team from the undergrads and grads who join us. I was especially happy about PyCharm. One of the nice things about coming here is that we were able to talk to the PyCharm team 
and then they were able to like, you know, the two have been really great, but they have an educational audition. Our programmers have been very happy with that. So the main takeaway that I want you to walk away from the ASL the clear project, is one is that Python has a strong role to play in the niche educational application. There's a great community. The language is easy to learn. Even though it's easy to learn, it's very powerful. And allows small research teams like ours to you know, get into the community, give speeches like this, and train a new generation of Python programmers. We have trained, I think, three different teams now over the past couple of years. When we get them, they don't know a lot of programming. But when, what they learn from us is they learn how to work with um, deaf and hard of hearing populations. They learn how to work with research teams. They learn, they learn how to work with different personalities and the dynamic environments. And then they go out into the world and they earn three times what I do. The second thing I wanted to talk about is the Python Summer Camp for Kids. Over the course of the past couple of years, we've fallen in love with the Python language. And we've decided that it's one of the easiest languages, one of the best languages to introduce programming to deaf and hard of hearing children. Again, our ultimate goal is to try to provide middle class lifestyle to these deaf and hard of hearing people. Most of them who, for whatever reason, for example, language deprivation, not access to limited role models, don't really feel that they can make it out in the world. We feel strongly that Python is a tool that can build confidence and knowledge. Now, the, the summer camp for deaf kids was originally started by Richard Ladner at the University of Washington. His summer camp had a broader focus than ours. We're less interested in some of the other topics they taught, for example, animation. We felt strongly that we wanted, if we had a smaller focus on a single topic, that we could provide a much stronger education over a shorter period of time. One of the challenges of being a low incident population, especially in the area of IDA and mainstream education, is that you really don't have access to a community of people who are like yourself. One of the downfalls or one of the pitfalls of IDA and mainstream education is that the focus is on educating the, the so-called normal people at the expense of the disabled person. So a lot of deaf people grow up, they never meet another deaf person. A lot of deaf children grow up, they don't realize that there are deaf adults outside in the world. They think that they will become hearing when they're 20, and I have met people who thought that deaf people simply die when they become adults. I am pretty sure that's not the case. So we really wanted to ensure that the deaf and hard of hearing kids had an opportunity to socialize with others like themselves. And most importantly, we wanted to introduce them to the Python language and to deaf STEM professionals who exist out there in the world to provide role models, to provide interaction experiences, and to teach them that you know, deaf people can succeed in STEM field, despite all the you know, challenges. To this audience, I don't really have to explain why Python is one of the best tools as an educational tool as an educational language, and for a community that has suffered so many different challenges. So I'll turn this over to Anne for the last few minutes. Well, I think, uh, hello? Are we live? Thank you. OK. Rather than taking up any more bandwidth right now uh, with details, they, I'm happy to drill down. Just catch me outside the conference or send John or I or Hakeem. Our third speaker wasn't able to attend because of visa issues. Uh, let's go right into a Q and A.
Yes, uh, thank you. Okay, first question. Um, first of all, thank you for giving such a great talk. I know you must have practiced um, a lot in order to do this so well. Uh, my brother is actually studying to become an ASL interpreter, and I know he would be very interested in learning more. What's the best way for him to do that? They offer many different ITP programs across the United States. Um, are you Canadian, are you American, or maybe I should not assume you're American, I'm sorry. Oh, um, he's already in a program in Colorado. I was wondering what's the best way for him to learn more about the work that you're doing. Oh, my work. Um, we are going to be releasing these applications within the next year. So right now, the best way to go to learn about a work is to go to bu.edu slash cscd. Thank you. CSCD. If I were smart, and I am not, I will put that on the slides. Next question. So would you mind going back to your interface um, and breaking down a little bit more what you mean by the term and the context and so on and so forth. And then perhaps maybe even before you do the interface, go back to your grid and uh, break down a little bit about the pieces of the sign and what a hand shape is and, and how positioning works and all that stuff so we can map better to what you're showing us. Okay, certainly. Hmm. Is this the slide you want, or is this the slide you want? Okay. ASL has five different parameters. These parameters correspond to, um, for example, in the spoken languages, you have the phonetic aspects, right? Phonetic power is phonemic. And phonetics for spoken languages are usually regarding to the position of the lips, um, the position of the tongue, and whether or not it's adequate, whether or not air is coming out or not. So those uh, correspond to the phonetic parts of spoken languages. The phonetic parts of a visual language are different. Of course, they're not using the mouth, the tongue, or the lips for air coming from in the voice box. Instead, they're using things like hand shape, which is what your hands look like, how they contort, um, the different locations of the joints and the fingers, movements, like is it going out or in, you know, path, direction, and internal movements, which are more fine, for example, twist, wiggle. You also have location, and these are where in the spatial plane the sign happens. For example, does it happen in neutral space? Does it happen on the head? Does it happen on the hands? You have modifiers, and these are the stuff that people tend to laugh at when they see the emergency broadcast. Like, oh, the interpreter is making such funny faces. Those are called non-manual markers, and they're inflectional and derivational morphemes. Derivation means it changes the grammatical class of the word. It turns it from a noun to a verb, for example. As for inflections, there are many different parts, but they tend to change things to like duration or intensity or manner. So our challenge, again, when dividing the interface was we had to take the different parts of ASL and say, how do we have stakeholders look at all these different parts of ASL and determine the composition of a sign in order for searching? We decided to simplify things a little bit. We're only looking at the three major parameters. So instead of things like palm orientation or non-manual markers, we look at solely hand shape, location, and movement, which research shows to be the most salient parts of the visual modality. So the next challenge was, as I mentioned before, was the sign dream. So between the beginning and the end of the sign, you may have many, many different hand shapes, locations, and movements. So again, to simplify things for stakeholders, we selected two hand shapes, the dominant hand, and then a base hand. For example, if I'm going to put a car 
next to somewhere, I would have it on the base hand, which represents the ground and, of course, the figure. So we decided to develop the interface according to those. Does that answer your question? Okay. Last question. Hey, thank you very much for the talk. This software is really cool. It's really neat to see you break all this out. Um, one thing I'm curious is how or even if the well hearing programming community can support the deaf and hard of hearing community. Well, there is a pretty broad question. Do you have anything specific that you'd like for me to answer? Um, I suppose in particular in regards to these tools that you put together, um, is there any way for well hearing programmers to get involved in efforts like this? I understand that this is something that definitely requires a lot of base knowledge as a deaf or hard of hearing person. Yeah, let me jump in. I don't speak or understand ASL. I come from a mathematics and scientific programming. If you're interested in solving interesting problems, that's all you need. You learn what you need. Uh, one of the things that makes diversity for deaf and hard of hearing a little different than gender or link other spoken languages is the expense of having interpreters or closed captioning. It's a major limitation towards career advancement. So one way is to help with fundraising and the other is at education and being open to alternate modes of communication be it texting, email, uh, and being patient until you find a modality that works well. John? We, many of the people that join our team, again, don't have a background in deaf or hard of hearing specific you know, um, fields. We train people. We teach them how to interact with the deaf or hard of hearing. So a lot of the students, one of the things that they benefit from is learning how to work with these you know, disenfranchised, marginalized communities. So we take everyone. Okay, we're out of time for this. So um, again, I think we uh, should thank this uh, for a, a very interesting, very interesting talk. The next talk for this session will begin in a little under 10 minutes.